Intermission by Swat Jester. And so it came to pass that the dwarves of Palm Lanterns, led by their mighty leader Frog, settled in their new home, Head Shoots. The journey was fraught with danger and lots of fucking zombies. Young ones, there's much I can tell you about the story of these brave dwarves. Well, mostly brave. Verviticus was a pussy. Hey! And Swat Jester was a hallucinating drunkard. Dude, I looked into the chasm, and it looked back into me. Ahem. And lest we forget the noble sacrifice of R2-D2. It's LCQC, asshole. Who bravely laid down his life, being clawed to fucking death by a skeletal fire imp for the holiest of treasures. The Rainbow Trout. Meanwhile, Facial Butter built our needed still from rocks. Special rocks. And Moto42 decided to torture a rat and then got headbutted in the spine. I cut it to watch it bleed. The pain is like a sudden rush for me. But lo, in our darkest hour, when we seem doomed for a life of mediocrity, we strike adamantium and are visited by a caravan. And on this joyous note, our mighty frog has decided to abdicate the throne to the scoundrel, the evil Vox Nihili. Will Headshoot survive? Will the undead naked mole rats rape LCQC's still unburied body? That, my children, is a story for another day. And that day is today at Let's Read Headshoots. Year 2. The Rule of Vox Nihili. A lot of dwarves talk about minerals like they know something. Gold this, marble that, bauxite, etc. But truth is, only a few know anyway about adamantine. Adamantine holds an edge five times better than iron, and is likewise five times harder. Yet it weighs only a fraction of iron. You say something's worth its weight in gold, but adamantine is worth 966 times as much as gold by weight. This miserable little hellhole is known as Head Shoots, named after an event in which one of the founders had his head burnt to a crisp by an undead imp, and they have adamantine here. You might be wondering why that matters to me. Turns out, I'm the overseer of mineral productivity. The kingdom's fallen into something of a decline recently, and a lot of the dead wood is being shipped off to dangerous places on ridiculously dangerous missions. These Danbull's Seven were told that they were on a vital mission to find still parts, of all things. Of course, no such shortage exists, but the dregs of society fall for pretty much anything as long as you make them feel important enough. Long story short, we sent a bunch of idiots into the wilderness to die, but now that they've happened upon Adamantine, it's up to me to set up a respectable outpost and mining operation. Hopefully they'll make it on their own for a few more days, though, because the giant scorpion scratching at the front door is making no signs of leaving. For now, I'll wait and watch. From the Journal of the Mineral Overseer I apologize for the paucity of entries, your highness, but the last few months have been fraught with chaos. I managed to slip into the fortress proper along with Moto42, who had been stranded outside with me when the giant scorpion wandered off for a short time. The inside of the fortress is relatively safe, but horribly disorganized. Seems as though Frog, who fancies himself the leader of this place, has managed to carve out a painfully disorganized workplace and barely adequate living areas for everyone but himself, while creating a massive cluttered quarters for himself. Fortunately, the area he's built for himself could someday befit royalty, so not all's in vain. Meanwhile, I've put together a list of the dangerous creatures that exist outside our shelter. Thankfully, most of them are trapped within various pits and chasms, but over a dozen monsters are able to threaten the surface, including various undead fire imps, undead troglodytes, undead giant bats, the giant desert scorpion, and other undead wildlife native to the mountain. 
However, I feel that with our sturdy doors and ongoing work on a retractable drawbridge, the situation is entirely... A giant desert scorpion has broken into the fort. Lorseth, help us. Lorseth sowed rust. Lorseth, the mist of guises, is a deity of the pulley of freckles. Lorseth most often takes the form of a female dwarf, and is associated with twilight, war, and victory. Frog carries the outpost only axe, and the two resident war dogs follow him loyally, so he will have to be the one to fight the creature. He runs down the hall, screaming wildly as other dwarves scramble around in panic. Then, suddenly, silence. Frog jogs back to the meeting area, boasting of victory. When I go to inspect the scene of battle, however, I find that he has merely managed to lock the beast in his own massive tomb. This will have to do for now. It then proceeds to fuck up Frog's tomb. <laughs> no big loss. Apparently our activity here has attracted the attention of kobolds. No, no one has yet to actually lay eyes on one. Valuable weapons left in the corpses of the undead by caravan guards have gone missing. <laughs> no matter... Each day we dig deeper, discovering more and more adamantine. As we dig deeper, the deposits grow richer. The wealth located in this place is enough to drive a dwarf mad. I order our miners to continue excavating as much of the precious mineral as possible, while also digging up veins of galena and tetrahedrite. Though the surface of this place is barren, the depths are swollen with wealth. Each little blue asterisk is a stone of adamantine ore. <laughs> deeper! Yes, deeper! <laughs> deeper! The supposed administrator of this place, Frog, has questioned the wisdom of delving so far into the adamantine deposits. I flash my royal badge and insist that he redeem himself for insulting my intelligence by clearing our entryway of the undead. He grabs a shield and an axe and is off. Frog proves to be more than willing to prove himself. He eagerly dispatches a zombie that managed to get inside. Then he moves outside to fight a skeleton and another zombie. He tears apart the skeleton and sends the zombie flying dozens of feet through the air. He goes off to attack three more nearby and promptly wrecks their shit. Frog has proven himself a worthy dwarf today. Despite everything, it looks like the situation here is turning out all right. Fortress value is booming, food supplies are stable, and the elven caravan is here. Oh no, not Land's Lantern again. The elves attempt to escape, but it's for naught. Their mule is hit with a fireball, and Land's Lantern moves in to finish it off. The elves survive, but with their beloved heart friend burnt to cinders, they have no interest in trading here anymore. As a silver lining, the mule drops his load as it dies, meaning potential salvage for us later, if we can get past the fire imps. Your ruler has arrived, dressed as a peasant. The queen, Sankus, has arrived! With twenty additional dwarves in tow, Sankus has decided to bless this blighted land with her holy presence. And with her arrival, the splendid halls of Administrator Frog fall to her position, including the tomb in which a giant desert scorpion is still residing. It is a time of rapid development and hard work. All the inhabitants of the outpost are toiling madly to bring the would-be fortress to the standards of a mountain home. I fear we'll not be entirely comfortable here for several years, as upon my arrival we had but 17 logs of timber, now reduced to two, for use in case of divine inspiration. Thus we don't have the capacity to build beds for even our current residents, and a bunk room has been built in the stead of additional bedrooms, so that the beds we have may be utilized more effectively. Barrels are now made of copper, and bins of silver and lead. Aside from the shortage, expansion continues at a good pace. A cobalt shows up to try his luck and quickly runs off. The creature makes it away with his life, enraging the queen and her faithful servant, me. I feel it's time to put together a proper dwarven assault force to deal with cobalts and other outside threats. 
Work on weapons and armor production is proceeding well, and I am about ready to conscript the first outpost militia. A fort's true wealth is measured first in its minerals, then in its inhabitants. The good Queen Sanka seems to have adapted decently to life here, complaining often of her rooms, but otherwise getting along well enough. Digging's going well. I feel several more layers of adamantine could be safely mined, but I have no desire to be that dwarf that goes down in history as bringing about the destruction of all non-demonic life. So, with a heavy heart, I've ordered that no more adamantine be mined at this time. Not that we're short of the precious metal. Dozens of strands and wafers await skilled hands already, and piles of adamantine ore lie on the ground. Truly, this place is mad. Yep, just one of the resident zombie trolls strolling by outside our paper-thin soil walls. Such wealth here, and so little keeping the evil outside at bay. No think Nish, the caravan is here. Wagons full of supplies. Now let's just hope that nothing gets in its way. Huh, the local wildlife is looking more tame than usual. This is this is good. I, I think everything is going to be okay. But then... Lands Lantern! And he brought a friend with him this time! Fortunately, dwarven livestock are a bit sturdier than the elvish equivalent. This camel takes a fireball from the legendary Lands Lantern and continues on his way. Caravan guards know no fear and rush in. They catch Lands Lantern and his compatriots still stalking the unarmed traitors and smash them into oblivion from behind. So falls Lands Lantern, who so fully embodied the atmosphere of this place. I'd hope to kill him personally, but this outcome is just as positive for us. And so the caravan arrives. Wood. Sweet, sweet tower cap wood. And tons of leather, meat, fish, barrels, and booze. Frog trades the vast majority of our stone crafts, throwing in the late LCQC's valuable giant cave spider silk clothes and a few gold goblets to seal the deal. Sankis Ikalurdim, Queen, has gone stark, raving mad. Yes, the news is true. Mad Queen Sankis insisted she will live here no longer, for the conditions were not befitting of royalty. Frankly, the conditions are not befitting sentient life in the least, but of course the Queen is hard to please. And then she roamed the halls like a vengeful spirit, screaming and babbling and tearing off her leopard leather dress and generally making quite the scene. Then she locked herself into her palatial quarters and refused to take food nor water. Now, she's dead. Had she lived but a few weeks longer, her rooms would have been adorned with gold and adamantine statues. But now our kingdom has no monarch. All is lost. As a servant of the monarchy, I feel personally responsible. Was it not my job to protect her? I consider ordering the miners to dig straight down through the adamantine, but what is there to gain by killing everyone else here? Suicide by demon is no honorable end. But perhaps I'll find a more fitting demise before the year is out. In positive news, we've had our first strange mood. Draconel, one of two lowly leather workers that showed up with the immigration, grabs three pieces of pretty standard leather and a bar of gold and gets to work. I suppose a celebration is in order. Draconel did manage to sew the most splendid leather dress I've ever seen, studded with gold nonetheless. Valued at around 44,000 ingots, it's something to be proud of. Draconel is now a legend in his craft and I have assigned him to create backpacks, bags, water skins, and other leather goods for the fortress. Sub Meramnozush, Immortality Dripped, the Pristine Vegetation. This is an elk leather dress. All craft dwarfship is of the highest quality. It is studded with gold, decorated with elk leather and mule leather, and encircled with bands of naked mole dog leather. Disaster. Orange Soda was doing who knows what, possibly trying to collect from the vast field of cave spider silk that I had forbade anyone to go near, when a massive skeletal bat ambushed him. He's been seen running over the hills in the distance. I consider sending Frog to end the creature, but suddenly I realize it's for me to do. 
I call a few peasants to arms, pick up a shield and sword, and sprint out the gate. I hear screams as I approach the top of the hill. Orange soda has been cornered. The skeletal monster tears at his face, and in moments his head is removed entirely. My recruits are hundreds of meters behind me, but I see the undead beast coming back. This is it! I shout and rush to intercept its flight back to the chasm, and it sees me. We charge! My companions are nowhere to be seen. When seconds I'll be in combat, and I score the first hit. Its hand is severed neatly from its body. But before I can take a breath, I'm knocked to the ground by its massive bony wings. The beast grabs my ankle with its remaining hand and attempts to tear me apart. I slash at it again and again and again, but its girth is too great. Its reach is too long. Claws and teeth rake my body. Everything is dark. Someone's shaking me. I open my eyes. The three recruits that came out with me are here. I cannot feel my legs. My right arm has been torn right out of the socket. There's a gaping hole in my chest, and I hear sucking as air goes directly into my lung through the gap. Beside me lie dozens of bones and bits of my body. How am I still alive? My companions look stern, but I see they're faltering. They're asking themselves the same question. I drop a breeze ninja close and whisper in his ear. I tell him the plans I've made to keep the fortress afloat until winter. I tell him the dark secret of the so-called Queen Sankus. Before I die, I tell him that he's a hero. He has slain Graspy Cyclone, who tore me asunder after murdering Orange Soda. I hear Nish, my god of creation, calling me. The end is here. Excerpt from Febreze Ninja's address given in the meeting hall. People of the last mountain home, we've suffered great tragedy this week. I'm not much of a speaker, but I feel that what Fox told me must be spoken aloud. First, let us have a moment of silence for Orange Soda and Fox, both good fellows who were involved with work above the call of duty even for a dwarf. Second, let's speak of why we're here now. With the death of Mad Queen Sankus, there's clearly no reason to build the capital here, but... But Vox. Vox heard the words of Nish in his very mind as he lay dying. He heard divine truth from the goddess herself, and he spoke it to me alone. And here I pass it along to you, my brothers and sisters in pick, hammer, and blood. What we have in this place is bigger than any of us, bigger than all of us, for we've settled upon the very root of evil itself. And every day that we weather and toil here in this sanctuary, the darkness of this place grows weaker. Even as we speak, the demons trapped at the root of this tortured mountain plot our downfall. The destruction of recent years has its very source in this mountain we now dwell upon. Even our queen, Sankus, was an agent of evil. Nish speaks that Sankus travels throughout the planes of existence, haunting, possessing, and tormenting as it goes. It is now returned to its home in the base of this very mountain, and it is our duty to open up the heart of this rock and tear out the demons within. The goblins will hinder us at every step. Even now, an ambush party stalks the hillside. They know we're vulnerable, and they too seek to snuff us out. But more dwarves will come. More people of the right path will assist us. We must use our machines and our might to blaze a trail into the heart of darkness. For we today are the Fellowship of the Right. The righteous will triumph here, upon this mountain! As the dwarves cheer, Professor Bling seems suddenly inspired and runs off alone. Professor Bling runs down to the metal crafting hall and claims a magma furnace, quickly grabbing up two wavers of adamantine and nothing else. What he creates will be envied even by the gods. Dwarves fall to their knees as they witness its splendor. Nstakud Viril Kilrar, Trail Machines, The Fellowship 
of right. This is an adamantine plate mail. All craft dwarf ship is of the highest quality. On this item is an image of Lands Lantern, the Fire Imp, and Kib Clinchworks, the Dwarf, in Adamantine. Kib Clinchworks is striking down Lands Lantern. The artwork relates to the killing of the Fire Imp Lands Lantern by the Dwarf Kib Clinchworks in head shoots in the early autumn of 107. On the item is an image of a dwarf in Adamantine. Light as a feather, tougher than diamond imbued with finer art than Nish herself wrought when she created the world, perfectly fit for the greatest dwarven hero to wear. Let it be noted that Professor Bling is now a legendary armorsmith and has created full suits of excellent iron chain armor and adamantine shields for our four resident warriors, Wandering Knitter, Holistic Detective, Dirty Deeds Done, and Nemo 2342. They lack quality weapons befitting of their armor, however. Additionally, let it be known that the goblin menace has arrived and is warring with the undead for the chance to destroy us.